First John chapter 5. Years and years ago, I was getting ready to preach on, you know, Sunday. I had to do Sunday school, morning service, evening service. It was a huge challenge for me to be able to do that much studying, but I studied a lot, and I studied hard, and I really tried to prepare, and lots of times I was done by Wednesday to it. I basically had an idea what I was preaching on. But one particular Sunday night, a long, long time ago, it was 10 minutes until church started, and I still didn't know what God wanted me to say. And I was very upset about it. And all of a sudden, I know it was the Lord, just all of a sudden, these scriptures about the deity of Christ started coming to my mind. Well, I've had a Thompson Chain Bible for years, and so what happens when you have a, a verse about any subject on the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, you can go then to the side, it would say, Deity of Christ. Then I went to the back of my Bible, and, and all of a sudden, there's a ton of verses on the deity of Christ. And so I wrote them down real quick, and I thought, wow, um, we'll just have the best service we can have. It's, it's going to be pretty bad, but, you know, we'll see what happens. And it was one of the best services we had. And it was that night that the Lord showed me that the deity of Christ is so fundamental, it is so important, it is so foundational to everything that we believe that the Spirit of God within believers loves to hear about the deity of Christ. You, you and I need to understand the deity of Christ. This is something that literally, this is a, a message tonight and, and for the next couple of Wednesday nights that, that's literally one of those if you do nothing else but just open to that hard page that doesn't say anything in the front of your Bible and write the deity of Christ and write down all these verses and as you discover verses on the deity of Christ over time, you can go add to that list. But this is extremely, extremely important. Sunday morning in my Sunday school class, I had a guest speaker and he said, what do you teach people? who have never heard anything about the Bible, where do you start? And um, somebody said, who God is. Well, that is where you start. But I think there's maybe even one thing that's more difficult than someone who's never been taught who God is, and that's someone who's been taught wrong about who God is. Because now the Spirit of God not only has to present truth, but He has to undo the lie. And, and God's capable of doing that, and He does it all the time around here. But we're going to equip you over the next couple of weeks with the scriptures that God will empower to take the blinders off the eyes of people around you. And I hope that many of them you've seen many times. Maybe, maybe you'll see some for the first time. Maybe this is what happens to me a lot. You'll see a verse you've known for a long, long time, but you just won't see that about it. And you're like, wow, how did I ever miss that? But 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, uh, if you want to, yeah, let's stand. Let's stand and, 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 and then we'll pray and we'll go on. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Let's pray. Father, we do ask you tonight to take the Word of God and touch every heart, Lord. Those that have known you the longest, touch theirs. And those that may be here tonight without you as their Savior, I pray you'd touch theirs. And Lord, those that maybe uh, weren't expecting, I don't know uh, what goes through our minds, but Lord, I just pray that no matter what we were expecting, you will speak to each and every one of us. We will have ears to hear and hearts that are open and will receive the great truths that you have for us tonight and, ha and receive them in a way that, Lord, our minds might even be thinking, how could we share this with our friends? How could we share this with our neighbors? That kind of a way. We want to be responsible with the great truths that you've shown us and use them for your honor and for your glory to help others. We pray tonight if there's even one lost soul here that tonight would be the night of their salvation. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. My guest speaker in Sunday school, after church Sunday night, we were talking and he said uh, he had gone to uh, a friend of his that was a pastor friend for a long time. He'd been a pastor friend for a long time. And he says, let me kind of tell you an overview of what God's doing where we are. And then I want to get your advice. So he gave him this overview of what God's doing where he is. And then he says, what do you think I should do? And the guy says, I don't know. And he said, no, come on. Okay, whatever God wants you to. He goes, I know that too. Okay, no, seriously. What do you think God wants me to do? 
And this is what he said. Keep going and start over. Keep going and start over. One of the difficult things for me as a pastor is to start over. But that's what you have to do. And that's what you as a church have to be willing to do. If we're ever going to be all that God wants us to be, we need to keep going and start over. And keep going and start over. And I don't know if you know where I'm getting now with this, but look, there was a time when you just got saved and you didn't really know hardly anything about the Bible. And somebody got up there and began to teach you and you just ate it up and you just loved it. But now, sometimes when people go back to those same subjects, you kind of already know what's coming. But they don't. There's new people that don't know. And so we need to keep going, but start over all the time. And that's kind of what we're doing now. Many of you have heard lots of teaching on this subject. We live in a place where you need to teach a lot on this subject. But some maybe have never heard any teaching on this subject. Turn with me to 2 John, verse 7. <coughs> 2 John, verse 7. It says, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now the word Jesus means Savior, Christ anointed. They, there are people that do not believe that the anointed Savior has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver, now listen to this, and an Antichrist. Now, I don't want us to confuse this with the Antichrist. This is a an Antichrist. That's, God's very specific about that. Any person that is against Christ is an Antichrist. Somebody out there teaching false doctrine about Jesus Christ is an Antichrist. They may not have started out to be an Antichrist. That may not have ever entered their mind. But God says whether they know it or not, they are an Antichrist. They're against Christ. And sometimes uh, just that very fact could help someone to go, I don't want to be against Christ. What does the Bible really say about Jesus? So he says in verse 8, Look to yourselves that we lose that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth, that means goes against, and abideth not in the doctrine, the teaching of Christ, the Bible teaching about Jesus Christ, hath not God. He that, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So this doctrine of Christ is so, so important. Now before we go any further... There's, there, it's super important, as the, as, the, as the missionary said in my class Sunday morning, who is God? Who's the God of the Bible? What are some things about the God of the Bible that make him totally unique? That there's no one like him. Now, there are many things. Um, for instance, there's no one as holy as the God of the Bible. Okay? He is perfect holiness. There is no one that loves like the God of the Bible. There's no one is just with perfect justice, perfect righteousness. All of these things like the God of the Bible. But one of the things about the God of the Bible that I think it's very important for the people that go to our church to understand is the God of the Bible is Jehovah God. The God of the Bible is the self-existent one. The God of the Bible is the creator of all created by none. I know you've heard some of this, but in all that is, there's only two categories. I don't know if you, you know, think about that. In all that is, there's only two categories. There's a line drawn, and on this side, there's God. And on that side, there's everyone and everything he created. Okay, this is the God we're talking about, the God of the Bible, the creator God, the self-existent one. There is no explanation for his existence. He's self-existent. He's e existent. He's eternal. He was not created. He is eternal in eternity past, eternity future. Super, super important because the God of the Bible needs to have preeminence in our life, not just be important, but preeminent in our life. Um, there's many things that are popping into my head at the same time, and I can't say them all at once. So, there are those that believe that the creator of this planet is God. They even use, spell it the same way, capital G, little O, little D. They even call him Elohim. They even call his son Jesus, and they call the Spirit the Holy Spirit. They have all the same names, the same words the Bible uses about God, but their definition of God is a created being. 
In other words, this God used to be a man on another planet, but the God that created that planet, um, this man fulfilled all the requirements and responsibilities that the creator of that planet wanted of him and said he could be God and made him God. And then this God is who they call the God of the Bible. That's not God. Remember, there's only two categories of all that is. Creator, created. Okay? To be the God of the Bible, you have to be uncreated and the creator of all that is. If there was ever a time you weren't, ever, you are not God. If you currently are not God, it's too late to ever become God because one of the responsibilities is to have always been God. Okay, now, I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm saying that because it's just a fact. It's, it's what the Bible teaches, okay? It's very important. I know it, it might seem funny to some of you, and I'm not scolding you or anything. It's just, it's, it's that fundamental. It's very, very important that you start there. Now, if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. So, when we say God, when I say the word God, most of the time, it's translated from the word Elohim, which is capital, it's, it's translated capital G, lowercase O, lowercase D. That's, what it's, that's how it's translated. That tells you that it's from the word Elohim. And every time you see it, a simple way to understand it is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Because God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In other words, the Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Spirit is eternal. They didn't create each other. They are uncreated. He is, uh, Elohim is God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, eternal God. Very important. So Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. And, and there are so many scriptures that we'll, we'll just hit a bunch of them tonight and stop. But Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Who do you suppose that's talking about? That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we could ask a question like this, which person of the Godhead became flesh? Again, I really I sincerely, if you've followed, if you've been around here long, I don't ask trick questions. I never try to trick you. I, I don't think there's any, I don't get that. I don't, I don't understand why people do. So I'm not asking a trick question. Which person of the Godhead became flesh? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit? The Son. Exactly right. Well, it says that he's God. And it says he's the everlasting Father. And it says he's the Prince of Peace. And anywhere that it says he's Savior, now I'm going to throw this out right now and we'll get to it later, but anywhere it says he's Savior, as you're turning with me to Matthew chapter 1, anywhere it says that he's Savior, he has to be able to save, okay? To be able to save, what are we talking about? Well, he shall save his people from their sins. Well, how do you, what does a Savior need to do to save his people from their sins? He needs to be able to forgive their sin. Well, what would he have to do to forgive their sin? Well, the sin must be paid for. But before we get to that, in order to forgive sin, the Bible says only God can forgive sin. So if a person comes up with a Savior, no matter what you name that Savior, if you name that Savior Jesus and you spell it J-E-S-U-S, -S, if that Savior does not is not creator God of the universe, then he does not have the power to forgive sin because he's not God. And if he's not God, he can't forgive sin. And if he can't forgive sin, he can't be your savior. Super fundamentally important to salvation, who Jesus is. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew chapter 1, <coughs> verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. We're going to go back to the Old Testament and see this which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. So there was a time when Jesus, God the Son, 
was born of a virgin. He left heaven, humbled himself, and came to this earth through a virgin named Mary and was born perfect, sinless, creator, eternal God. And he lived a perfect and sinless life. Therefore, he owed no sin debt. Okay? Because he owed no sin debt, he could die for the sin of others. And he died for all of our sin. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. Okay? He gave up the ghost. He died for you on purpose because he loves you. Okay? Um, we'll get to that other verse I was talking about right now. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah 7. I know we're going back and forth a bit. But Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 Great, great verse. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Okay, it's a sign. Remember any group that required a sign? The Jews required a sign. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. We already saw the fulfillment of that and the interpretation of that is God with us. So, again... Just trying to really break it down so that we don't miss anything. He says he's going to give a sign. And unfortunately, there are some English translations of the Bible that in totally wipe out the miracle. The miracle is the virgin birth. It's not a sign of anything miraculous. Well, birth is miraculous, and I understand that. But it's not the sign of Jesus being virgin born unless you have a virgin. Okay, so it's very important that it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. This is an amazing miracle of God that through a virgin, God is going to, to, to take God the Son, He's going to be born on planet Earth. Okay, this is amazing. And, it, and think about it. You know, we talked a little bit about this at uh, one of the Christmas, uh, Christmas messages I had about Joseph and uh, it really hit me what he went through. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about Mary being pregnant, being with child, we'll say, and she's never been with a man? So she tells a few people if they ask, well, no, I'm carrying the Son of God. What? I'm the chosen, I'm the one that was prophesied, I'm, I'm the virgin that's carrying the Son of God. Can you, I know that we sometimes look back on, on things that happened in the Bible, and we can't believe people acted that way and all that. We, we might have acted that way, because that had never happened before, and it's never happened since. And then, can you imagine her dad trying to, no, it's, it's okay. No, it's not okay. Your daughter's going to have a baby. She's not married. And she says she's a virgin. Okay? Then... We don't see any mention of Joseph at all, ever, after Jesus is 12 years old. Luke 2.52, right in that section, is about the last time you ever see Joseph alive. Imagine this, that the whole time that Joseph is, is watching over, over Jesus and watching him grow up, the whole time, pretty much most people think they're a family of liars. And it's not until Jesus is a full-grown adult of about 30 years old that he turns the water into wine and he feeds the multitudes and he heals the blind and on and on, miracle after miracle, raises the dead. Surely, this must be the Son of God. All men seek him. But I don't think Joseph got to see that part. But he still believed, and he trusted, and he, was, he had faith that it was all that God said it was, and it was. Turn with me to Micah chapter 5. Some of these Old Testament books can be hard to find. Micah chapter 5. <clears throat> It's Micah 5, 2. It's a super awesome verse in the Bible. It says, but thou, 
Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrata means fruitful. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Judah means praise. Great name. It's a great name. Have you ever met anyone named Judah? Probably. There's a few. You know, if you went on the internet and looked up Judah, there, you're going to find a few. There's, I think there's, there are some people named Judah. That's a great name because um, for years and centuries, people named their children based upon what the names meant, not just it sounded good or <laughs> it felt good or whatever, but they, they really went with what they meant. And, you know, when a baby's born, it's such a miracle. It's such an amazing thing. There's so much praise. It just makes sense to name your baby Judah. Well, the New Testament equivalent of the word Judah is Judas. And I don't know of anybody named Judas. And the reason I don't know of anybody named Judas is because of one man named Judas. And that one man named Judas, when he betrayed the Lord the way he did, and drugged the name of the Lord through the mud the way he did, all these centuries later, nobody seems to want to name their kid Judas. And that's fine. Um, but I've literally never met a person named Judas. And usually if I preach somewhere different or even in another country, I, now it's become a, um, like just a, a question. I want to know. Uh, if, if I was preaching somewhere in some foreign country, I would make sure and ask that question. Is there anybody here named Judas? I've never found one. Because people don't want to associate their precious little child with Judas. And I'm really convinced that many people don't want to take the name Jesus because of how we many times have drugged his name through the mud. If you really start thinking about Jesus, why wouldn't everybody want to know Jesus? I can't think of any reason to not want to know Jesus. Everything about him is wonderful, but it's his representatives that kind of mess it up. So, yet out of these shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the Bible tells here a, an amazing prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be born in Bethlehem. This little place uh, of, of Judah, the house of bread, the bread of life is going to be born in the house of bread and make it a fruitful thing and make it a place of praise. And that's what he did. And so there's a specific prophecy there about the birthplace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he is from everlasting. That's important because only God is from everlasting. Um, now turn with me to, to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, again, don't ask trick questions. Which person of the Godhead was pierced? The Lord Jesus Christ. Then, he just flat out tells you, you're talking about me. He says, I am. I am. Okay, I know, I know the sentence goes on. But when Jesus says, I am, he means it every time. And the I am that I am, well, I don't know what week we'll get to that. But when, when he says, I am, he's saying he's Jehovah God. That's big. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I hope you're writing these down or, or, or have a photographic memory or something. The Almighty, okay? He says he is the Almighty. Jesus Christ is Almighty God. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 is, uh, it's great. It's one of those that you kind of have to think about a bit. And you take the information that you receive there and then you take it throughout the Bible and, and, and the picture kind of, kind of unfolds as you look at, at these other scriptures and see the big picture. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Who is the one? This is a prophecy about somebody who's going to come and cry in the wilderness. 
And it's okay to answer. Who is that? John the Baptist. So it's a prophecy about John the Baptist. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Very, very interesting. All capitals. Prepare ye the way of Jehovah God. Okay? He says, There's going to be a preacher come who's going to cry out in the wilderness, and he is going to prepare the way for Jehovah God. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay? He's, making, he, he's getting ready for Jehovah God. And if you have any doubt about whether he's talking about this person's God, he says make, he's going to make a highway for our God. He's going to prepare the way for our God. So now there's other places you can go, but let's go to Mark. Turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Okay, so who is that person? It's going to tell you, John the Baptist. Who is he preparing the way for? Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jehovah God. These are very, very powerful verses. Let me show you a fun one. <laughs> it's fun to me anyway. Uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. So here's Nicodemus. He's not just a Pharisee. Historical books tell us he's a member of the Sanhedrin, a group of 70 that, ruling Pharisees that ruled over the other Pharisees. He knows the Bible. And this is something that we all need to be cautious of. You can know the facts of the Bible without knowing the God of the Bible. And we don't want that. Uh, we want to know the Lord as our Savior. We want to know, we want to get to know Him better and better. So it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you know a lot about the Bible, but you don't know about the Savior. Now hold your place here and we'll come right back, but I, I really think we need to look at this verse. John chapter 5, verse 39. This is one of the verses I had to memorize in Bible college early on. Kind of bothered me because guess what? I didn't, I hate to admit this to you, but I didn't understand it. And so I thought, I'm a little bit confused. So Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And I was thinking, well, that's what I think too. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So you know what he was saying? He's saying to these religious leaders, you better get back in that Bible that you know so much about because somehow you got in that Bible that's all about Jesus and he's standing here in front of you right here, right now, and you don't even know it's Jesus. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. You've got to come to the point as you study and read the Word of God that you see Jesus in it, that you see the need of salvation in it, that you see that He's the only hope of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now He's come to Nicodemus and He tells him <clears throat> in verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, to you, Nicodemus, T-H-E-E, -E, I'm talking to you. Now He's saying it nice, but I want you to understand, I want us to see it together tonight, that when it says T-H-E-E, -E, it's talking to you. Okay? Verily, verily, I say unto thee. I'm not talking to anybody else tonight, Nicodemus. I'm talking to you. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Hey, if you're born from your mom, you're born in water, that's a fleshly birth. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye. Isn't that interesting? So now he says, Nicodemus, don't marvel that I'm saying unto you that ye 
must be born again. We'll just draw a big circle around every single person on the planet. So Nicodemus, you and you alone have got to be born again if you're going to heaven. Just like everybody else. Just like ye. Ye is... Ye is not just, you could say the word ye like he just did here. Jesus isn't out of line at all. He's using the perfect English. He's saying when he says ye, I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to everybody else. When he says thee, he says, I'm just talking to you. And so, yeah, throw out the, the thees and the yees, but you're not going to be able to see everything God has for you. So don't throw it out, okay? Um, verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is, that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? The word master many times means teacher uh, of Israel. And knowest not these things? Verily I say unto thee, uh, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen. And ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now get ready for this. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. This is an awesome verse. I love this verse. It's one of those verses that you have to think, and it's all there. And so... Man, I hate it when people do this to me, but Brother Jim, could you stand up here with me? Sorry. I was going to have Brother Scott be heaven, but then I didn't want to pick someone else, you know, for, never mind. Uh, so, let's just, it doesn't even mention hell in this verse. But, um, so, let's just imagine uh, that he's Jesus, I'm Nicodemus, and he's trying to win me to himself. He's trying to show me that I need to be born again. He's told me a bunch of times. And he's trying to, he, he, he probably realizes that I know what the, that the Bible says, that only God can forgive sin. And so he's trying to help me realize that he is God. So he says to him, says to, I'm getting mixed up here, but he says to me that while he's talking to me right here, at the same time that he's talking to me right here, he's in heaven. Okay? The omnipresence of God. Only God can be in more than one place at a time and more than one time at a place. Okay? God's omnipresence. And he is using this simple, easy to miss verse here to help Nicodemus see, I am the Messiah. I am the guy you preach about. I'm the one that you've prophesied. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I just, it's hard to illustrate it without another person or something to help represent the other person. So thank you very much. So it goes on here to say, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember John 12, 32? And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The, the verse that I really wanted to show you here about the deity of Christ and the omnipresence of Christ is verse 13, where he said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. He said, I'm in heaven right now while I'm standing here talking to you. And that's pretty amazing. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to have to be done here in just a minute. Acts chapter 20. So many incredible verses all through the Bible that are clearly teach that Jesus is God. And as you're turning to Acts 20, again, please, please, you, you need to know, we need to know that we're surrounded by people that you could probably take these verses to and they might not argue with you, okay? Because the leaders have come to a point where they say, we believe that Jesus is the God of the New Testament and the Jehovah of the Old Testament. They say it. But the problem is, is if you believe the God of the Bible to be a created being, you're not talking about the same Jehovah. 
You're talking about a, a fictional character that unfortunately your leaders gave the same names to that the Bible uses of the real, true, and living God. And it becomes very confusing. So I wouldn't get discouraged right away if you're showing someone, see the Bible, and you're showing the deity of Christ, and they begin to agree with you and nod their head and maybe even be sincere. And you might be thinking, oh, no, I'm messing this up. No, you're not. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it may be that that's the, 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 the way that God brings them to this realization is through this, this absolute undeniable fact that Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the God of the New Testament. That God is, or the Godhead is, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it may take all of that to bring them to a point of being able to understand, oh, God... Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is the creator being. He is an uncreated being. I was believing in the wrong God the whole time. A person has got to come to that point. To be born again, you can't... Listen to this. I've used this illustration, so I'll keep using it. If I name that piano Jesus... And then I show you a verse in the Bible that says Jesus can answer prayer. And you go to the piano and ask Jesus to answer your prayers, believing that that piano is Jesus. It's just a piano. And if somebody makes up a character and does a great job of it, I mean great job of it, makes up a character or two or three and assigns the same names that the Bible does to those characters, it does not make those people uh, the same as the Bible. Okay, the, it, the, the God of the Bible is creator, eternal God. So Acts chapter 20, he's preaching there, uh, teaching the, 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 the elders, the pastors of, at Ephesus. It, starts in verse, Ephesus, it starts in verse 17. But down to verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. By the way, this is a great study right here. I'm going to throw this in on a side note. Verse 17, he's talking to the elders. Okay, take heed to the flock. An elder, the word elder means ruler, that kind of a leader. Uh, who takes care of a flock? A shepherd. The word pastor means shepherd. The word bishop means overseer. Interesting, because take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, made you bishops, made you pastors, made you elders, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The church of God was purchased with the very blood of God. Again, no trick questions. Which person of the Godhead shed his blood to pay for our sin? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.